Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. We begin with Allah's blessed name. We praise Him and we glorify Him as He ought to be praised and glorified. And we pray for peace and for blessings on all his noble messengers, on our father Adam, on our father Abraham, on Moses, on Jesus, and on his mother, the Blessed Virgin Mary, and on the last of them all, the Blessed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. As we greet you from the studios of the Islamic Broadcasting Network here in my beautiful island, Caribbean island of Trinidad, with Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. It is today, uh, for me, it is the third day of Muharram in this new year. So Happy New Year to you. May Allah grant you a blessed year. I mean, it is the year 1442 since the Hijrah. And uh, on this day, the third day, uh, I would recite Surah An-Nisa of the Qur'an. Uh, there is a methodology for reciting the whole Qur'an. And don't attempt to study the Qur'an unless you're first reciting the Qur'an as it ought to be recited. Um, the news for today is that... Uh, uh, we are trying to get Constantinople in the Quran translated to the Greek language. Uh, and we've decided that we'll have it professionally translated in Greece. And uh, we already have uh, two sponsors to assist us in meeting the cost of translation. If you would like to assist us in meeting the cost of translation and in the cost of printing the books, uh, do please send me an email. Uh, I would like to have the book published before, uh, published in Greek, that is, before I arrive in Athens, inshallah. Um, we are arranging discussion sessions in two cities in Greece, uh, in Athens and in the north in Thessaloniki. And uh, we're, going to, we're going to rent a vehicle and we're going to drive all the way from Athens, all the way north, to Thessaloniki, I have heard it's a beautiful drive. Mm? But if you would like me to come to your city, uh, if you can arrange a small uh, discussion session with scholars, uh, send me an email and we'll try to see whether we can accommodate you. Our topic today is a fascinating one, and it is connected with the previous uh, subject of Hagia Sophia. Our topic today is the Quran and Hagia Sophia and geopolitics at the end of history. Is that not a fascinating subject? Yes. But you cannot, you cannot study the Quran on the subject of geopolitics at the end of history and how it's connected with Hagia Sophia, how it is connected with Constantinople, unless you adopt the proper methodology for the study of the Quran and for the study of the Quran as it pertains to the end of history. A pilot who is navigating a ship in the ocean, can he determine the direction to which the ship should be traveling by looking at one star? No. No, he cannot do that. And Allah has spoken to us in the Quran about proper methodology. Let, please be patient while I explain it one more time. It is Suratul Waqiya of the Quran. And this is what Allah says, Ba'da'uzu billahi min shaitanir rajim. فَلَا أُقْسِمُوا بِمَوَاقِعِ النُّجُومِ And I take an oath by the mawakin, plural of makan. Mawakin, makan is place. The mawakin, the mawakin of the nujum, the places or the positions in which the stars are located. Allah takes an oath by that. 
وَإِنَّهُ لَقَسَّمٌ لَوْ تَعْلَمُونَ عَظِيمٌ And Allah says, this is not an ordinary oath or qasam. This is the mother of all oaths. What is it? The positions in which the stars are located. And then he goes on to say, إِنَّهُ لَقُرْآنٌ كَرِيمٌ Meaning that this subject of the positions in which the stars are located is connected with this subject or the Quran. Quran means a recitation. إِنَّهُ لَقُرْآنٌ كَرِيمٌ This is a recitation which is noble. This is a recitation which is generous. If, if, if you are faithful to this Quran, if you study this Quran as it ought to be studied, then Allah will raise you. This Quran will raise you to a position of nobility. And this Quran will be generous, generous, generous to you. Hmm? لا يمسه إلا في كتاب مكنون. This Quran is located in a book which is which is protected. A book which is protected. لا يمسه إلا المطهرون. None can touch this Quran except those who are clean and pure in their hearts. Is this touch? To be understood literally? Of course not. Anybody can touch the Quran. You don't have to be clean and pure. Anybody. So it's not literal. It has to be interpreted. So what the Quran is saying is that insofar as penetrating the meaning, the wisdom, the knowledge of this Quran is concerned, none can penetrate it even to touch it unless you are faithful to the Qur'an, not just you are pure and clean internally in your relationship with the Qur'an and with Allah. And therefore, if in order to study the stars, you have to go to all the stars and you have to see how the stars are interconnected with each other to be able to read the stars, the big picture. Similarly, you can't study the Qur'an by simply focusing on one verse. You have to go to the totality of verses. You have to realize and understand and, and, and uh, discover how the verses are interconnected with each other. My teacher of blessed memory, Maulana Dr. Muhammad Fadlur Rahman Ansari, Rahimahullah, he said you have to discover the system of meaning. They don't teach this in any Darul Uloom or any Jamia today. This is a scholarship that we used to have long ago. Now we've lost it. And we're making an attempt to revive this scholarship. You have to be able to locate the system of meaning, how the verses are in connected, interconnected with each other. Similarly, with the end of history or Akhidul Zaman. You cannot study the end of history by focusing on one topic. No, you have to go to the totality of all things that are connected with the end of history and see how they are interconnected with each other. That is scholarship. And so when we go to uh, the Quran and geopolitics at the end of history. Obviously, this is not <laughs> this is not a subject for schoolboys who focus on only one part of the subject. This is a subject for scholarship, real scholarship, that will devote years and years and years to the subject to understand it. An understanding does not come only from the rational faculty. Understanding does not come only from logic and rationality. The understanding also comes from something. It's a lovely word in the English language. Mm. In Arabic, it's basira. 
In English language, they put the word in in front of the word sight, and they coin a new word insight. And we say not just insight, but spiritual insight, that Allah places nur in the heart. And when someone sees with the nur of Allah, then that spiritual insight, that spiritual insight is what allows you to connect the dots. And so may Allah bless you, those of you who now listen carefully to what I'm saying, and who now want to study the Quran as it ought to be studied, and who realize it cannot be studied without proper methodology and without internal, intuitive, spiritual insight, basira. May Allah bless you with that nur. So when we come to the end of history and we seek the understanding from the Quran about the end of history, the first thing that we realize about the end of history is that a new civilization appears on the stage of the world. It came out of nowhere. And it quickly assumed the position of dominance, which has a power which none can stand up to. And it uses that power to spread itself out all over the world. They spread out all over the world. And they take control of power in the world, modern Western civilization, and this lecture is being delivered only to those who think. And may Allah bless you if you make the effort to think. Allah sent the Quran to people who think. And so today I'm talking to you, not to the others. I'm talking to you who, who long for understanding who thirst for knowledge, who hunger for truth. My lecture is for you. Modern Western civilization is the most fascinating thing to have occurred in history, the most astonishing thing to have occurred in history, a civilization that came out of nowhere and yet quickly took control of the world. It has unmatched power, and its power is constantly increasing. It uses that power in an imperial way to establish its imperial rule over the world. It wants to rule the world. It has a lust to rule the world, but it rules the world by oppressing mankind. It uses power in a wicked way. It uses power to oppress, and it operates by way of deception. It presents itself as the best civilization it has ever been the good fortune of mankind to witness. It presents itself as a civilization which has come to replace everything that came before it. All civilizations we came, which came before this civilization are now, in that pretty phrase of Arnold Toynbee, uh, used in his famous book, Civilization in Tri on Trial. It's a good book to read. It was published in 19, perhaps 1947. Uh, Arnold Toynbee, the British historian. And the name of the book, Civilization on Trial. And he used this pretty phrase. He says that modern Western civilization came to replace all previous civilizations and to claim that all previous civilization, including the civilization of Islam, are now belongs to the museums of history. They are obsolete. They are moribund. They are like la the laptop computer which is now out of, out of fashion, is gone. And it's replaced by something superior. 
That laptop used to be so big and weighing about 15 pounds. Today's laptop weighs only two or three pounds. <laughs> That laptop was so slow. This one is so fast. So modern Western civilization has come to replace everything that preceded it. And everything which preceded it now belongs to the museums of history. They are obsolete. They are moribund. And modern civilization has come to take control of the world and remain in control of the world forever and ever. Can this be by accident? What is the explanation for this? Modern Western civilization not only conquered the rest of the world, but did more than that. They colonized the rest of the world. And when they colonized the rest of the world, it was not just to steal their wealth, to make Britain wealthy beyond all dreams. Steal their wealth through devious means, like, for example, the monetary system, to make the United States the richest country ever. Modern civilization, Western civilization, had a more sinister agenda than that. They were not just thieves. They also wanted to transform the rest of the world into carbon copies of themselves. They were, for example, a secular civilization. Secularism meant that knowledge comes only from rationality and from observation. And that which could not be observed could not be known. And therefore, it's, if it's in only the material universe that we can observe, then this is the only world that exists. It cannot be known. Nothing else can be known. And therefore, there is no reality beyond material reality. That's modern Western civilization. So goodbye <laughs> to religion. <laughs> goodbye to the scriptures. There is no reality beyond material reality. And so religion belongs to ignorant people. Sensible, learned, intelligent people, men of knowledge and wisdom, they're not religious people. And so when modern Western civilization colonized the rest of the world, it then went on to transform the rest of the world into secular societies that would be carbon copies of itself. And so secular politics, secular economics, a secular monetary system. The monetary system is not connected, is not concerned with values, no. And so you could take gold and silver out of the market, money with intrinsic value, and replace it with money which is just paper and has a fictitious value. And you can manipulate the value of the paper and rip off mankind and eventually enslave them. We don't care two peanuts about values, about integrity. Money doesn't have to have integrity. This was modern Western civilization. The Quran says that it came to explain all things. And I am asking my intelligent and learned listening audience, I'm not talking here to schoolboys, can it be that there is nothing in the Quran to explain modern Western civilization? Not only does modern Western civilization take control of the world, rip off the world, transform the world into carbon copies of itself, but more than that, modern Western civilization has an agenda. It has an obsession with the Holy Land. And I wrote this book, Jerusalem in the Quran, 20 years ago, I wrote this to explain that obsession with Jerusalem, with the Holy Land. Modern Western civilization struggle with something called 
Crusades, even before they had become secularized, they had already embarked on this obsession to liberate Jerusalem. And so they had the Crusades. And when they were waging the Crusades, these Christian people of Western Europe didn't care two peanuts for their Christian brothers on the other side of the world. The Orthodox Christians of Russia and Greece and Bulgaria and the Balkans and so on. The Orthodox Christians of Syria. They didn't care two peanuts about them. Those Christians had Hagia Sophia as their central cathedral. These Christians are waging their jihad to liberate Jerusalem, but in the process, they're also seeking to liberate Hagia Sophia. And on the Third Crusade, they actually succeeded in conquering Constantinople. So not only did they wage jihad against Muslims, they waged jihad against their own Christian brothers. And when they conquered Hagia, Con Constantinople, they took control of Hagia Sophia. I believe, I, I hope I'm not wrong, I think they converted it into a stable or something. And then uh, the Allah helped the Orthodox Christians and they able, after 80 years, to drive them out and recover Hagia Sophia and re recover Constantinople. When they did liberate Jerusalem, finally, in, was it 1917, when General Allenby uh, defeated the Ottoman Empire and took control of Jerusalem? Excuse me. They then proceeded to bring the Jews back to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own, and then to restore a state of Israel in the Holy Land, and to declare that this is Holy Israel of Solomon, Nabi Suleiman, alayhi salam. Can this be by accident? What is the Islamic eschatological explanation of the phenomenon of modern Western civilization. I am not talking to schoolboys. I'm talking to those of you who long, with your longing in your heart to penetrate the Quran. You are the ones I'm talking to today. And our answer is that you have to connect all the dots in the Quran. All the verses of the Quran, you have to connect them to be able to understand what does the Quran say about modern Western civilization and therefore about geopolitics in Akhir Zaman or the end of history. I doubt whether I can complete this subject in, in the half an hour which is left for me. But it's a fascinating subject. And you will find some of the answers in this book. You'll find some more of the answers in this book. That was Jerusalem in the Quran. And this one is Constantinople in the Quran. You'll find even more answers in this book. The Quran, the Great War and the West. You'll find answers in this book. Dajjal, the Quran, and Awwalu Zaman, or the beginning of history. You'll find it in this book, the second book on Dajjal, uh, the Quran, Dajjal, and the Jasad. Uh, you'll find it in this book, explaining Israel's mysterious imperial agenda. You'll find it in this book, the religion of Abraham and the state of Israel. A view from the Quran and the other book which is missing, I don't know who took, oh yes, somebody borrowed it, on Gog and Magog, uh, an Islamic view of Gog and Magog in the modern world. When you go to all the verses of the Quran on the subject of Akhir Zaman or the end of history, we, take, we are taken to Constantinople. When uh, when they saw Jesus crucified before their very eyes, 
because Allah says, Walakin shubbihalahum. It was made to appear to them that he was crucified. Some of them were weeping and others were celebrating. Those who were celebrating, Allah expelled them and then broke them up into bits and pieces and scattered them all over the world. They can never again take control of a city to re-establish a holy state. وَقَطْعَنَاهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ أُمَمْ But these who are weeping, who now are called an nasara and those are called Al-Yahud, the Jews, and these are called an nasara the Christians. Allah blessed these. Why should he not? Because they recognized him as the Messiah, and they loved him, and they followed him, and they wept when they saw what happened. So he blessed them. And in the uh, prophecy, the hadith of Prophet Muhammad والسلام, Allah blessed these Christians to conquer a city without having <laughs> to fight for it. It was Constantinople, Constantinople. Let me repeat that. According to the hadith of Prophet Muhammad, Allah's blessings be upon him. Allah blessed these Christians to conquer a city without having to fight for it. It was Constantinople. Janibun minha fil bahr wa janibun minha fil bar. Part of the city adjoins the land and part of the city is by the sea. And in the city are a people, an Israelite people for whom the law of the Sabbath is obligatory. The Sabbath came down only to the Israelite people, not to anybody else. So it has to be a people who were in Jerusalem and expelled, and who are now blessed to conquer the city. It couldn't be the Jews, because Allah has cut them up into bits and pieces and scattered them all over the world. I am speaking today to those who think and who will therefore recognize that Allah ordained that the Christian people should conquer Constantinople without fighting. After they had conquered Constantinople, then the Prophet said, alayhi salatu waslam, that the Dajjal was released amongst them, the Antichrist. And so the Antichrist now gets to work with the Christian people and he, he is successful in getting part of those Christian people to abandon the law. Because the law says that on the Sabbath day you're not allowed to work and therefore you're not allowed to fish. And when Allah tested them by sending the fish only on the Sabbath day, and on all the rest of the days of the week, no fish. What a test. But these people were now corrupted. They had, been, they had lost their religion, essentially, and they, because they abandoned the law. And they went fishing on the day of the Sabbath. And Allah cursed them. Cursed them. And he said, Kunu kiradatan khasayin. So part of the Christian world is cursed. To live like apes, to live like apes. That part of the Christian world which was cursed to live like apes, eventually, the monkey does not wear clothing. He's naked, but that's his way of life. Nothing shameful about that. But these are human beings, but now they live like monkeys. And they have a preference for public nakedness. So they start taking off clothes, particularly the women, until they are stark naked. That's right. Living like monkeys. Public nakedness. And then these are people who live like monkeys who have their bedroom life in public. But that's not shameful for the monkeys, but for human beings. Your bedroom life should be private, but they show a preference 
for public sexual relations. These people now leave Constantinople and they go to the West, and that is the origin of modern Western civilization. A Christian people who have essentially abandoned the law and eventually would live an atheist way of life. That's Britain today. All the churches, all the cathedrals, all the monasteries are up on sale because nobody goes to church anymore. And they show a preference to live like apes, like monkeys, with uh, public nakedness and a preference for sexual relations in public. Again, I am speaking today only to those of you who have a capacity to think, not to schoolboys. And so this is the first Islamic eschatological explanation of the emergence of modern Western civilization. But from where? The power of this civilization to conquer the world. When we go <laughs> to that subject, we go to Gog and Magog. Yes. And if there is one subject in which I have lectured for 20 years or more, and yet has remained a solitary voice crying in the wilderness with very, very few who speak on the subject and Gog and Magog in agreement with me. Most, absolutely most, the overwhelming majority of Islamic scholarship hold the view that Gog and Magog have not been released as yet. They will be released from the barrier built by Zulkarnain only after Jesus returns. There are others, a very few, who also speak on Gog and Magog, but their views differ with mine. Even if I am but a solitary voice, it doesn't matter to me at all, and it should not matter to you. Your duty is to seek the truth. And when you are convinced that you have found the truth, then very humbly proclaim it. Proclaim it courageously, even if you have to be a solitary voice, confident the truth will pre prevail, and everything that seeks to rival truth will go down the river. Who are Gog and Magog? They're human beings. I have lectured extensively on the subject uh, after Ramadan. And my lectures are all on, on YouTube. I don't know how long they will last on YouTube, but uh, may Allah grant that it may survive. The rabbis in the northern city of Yatrib, now called Medina, had said to the pagan Arabs, if you want to know whether this man, Muhammad, Allah's blessing be upon him, is indeed a true prophet of the one God, ask him these three questions which only a prophet can answer. The answers are not located in history. Don't bother to try. And one of the questions was asked him about the great traveler who traveled to the two ends of the land. And uh, Zulkarnain, the, the answer came down in the Quran, his, this traveler is Zulkarnain. And Zulkarnain means either someone who possesses two horns or someone who impacts on two ages, two generations, two epochs. And our view is that Zulkarnain is not any historical personality. We reject the view that he is Cyrus or he is Darius or he is... Whoever it is, we reject that view. We say that we will not identify Zulkarnain. We will not identify Zulkarnain with any historical personality. Rather, it is an event which will occur twice in history. Karnain means two times, two ages. And Zulkarnain has power. But Gog and Magog also has power. And Zulkarnain, however, he uses power to punish the oppressor. And Zulkarnain has faith, so power rests on the foundations of faith. But Gog and Magog are essentially godless. They are secular. 
and they used power. Allah gave them the power, but they used that power to oppress. And so Zulkarnain traveled in the direction of the setting of the sun, and he came to the Black Sea. And there he met a people, and Allah spoke to him. Allah spoke to him. Allah spoke to him and said, Ya Zulkarnain, O Zulkarnain, either you use your power to punish or to, be, to, to, to reward. What, what are you going to do with these people living by the Black Sea? And he says, I'm going to punish those who are oppressors or wicked and those who are good, righteous, I will reward them and treat them nicely. On the first occasion, power therefore emerged in the region of the Black Sea, and Crimea commands the Black Sea. And then he traveled in the direction of the rising of the sun, and then thirdly he traveled to a pass between two mountain ranges, and there he came across a people who said to him that Gog and Magog are committing facade. Facade is that which corrupts, but corruption which is so wicked it is destroys. Can you help us and build a barrier to protect us? And he built the barrier. And Gog and Magog could neither penetrate nor could they scale the barrier. But once he built the barrier, he then spoke these words, which Alexander could not speak. <laughs> and Cyrus could not speak. No, no. He said, This barrier which I built is an act of kindness from my Lord God. For Iza ja awadu Rabbi, but when that time comes of which my Lord has won, Jaalahu Dakka Allah is going to bring down the barrier. Wakana wadu Rabbi Hakka. And then the warning of my Lord will come to pass and Gog and Magog will be released. And so said, so done. Gog and Magog were eventually released. When were they released? How would we know that they are released? Because when they are released, Allah says about them, I have created creatures of mine so powerful, none can destroy them but me. So when Gog and Magog are released, they will have a power which cannot be matched by anyone in the world. And uh, they will use that power to oppress wickedly. No power in the world could stand up to them. So when will they be released? When will Allah bring down the barrier? The answer is located in the Quran. And I'm speaking one more time to people who think and who are faithful to the Quran. It is to Surah Al-Anbiya that we now turn. If you want to study the Quran and geopolitics in Akhir Zaman or the end of history, here you are. Allah speaks of a town. And he destroyed the town. And he expelled the people of the town. And he placed a ban on them. They could never return to that town to reclaim it as their own. Until, until when? Until Gog and Magog are released. And after they are released, they spread out all over the world. min kulli hadabin then these people will re be brought back to that town. Which town is it that is connected with Gog and Magog? Which town is it that Gog and Magog are going to be, are going to be um, the people are going to return to that town? Gog and Magog will bring them back. The answer is provided by Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, who said, that when Gog and Magog are released, that is, the barrier is brought down, the first of them will pass by the Sea of Galilee on their way to Jerusalem. And by the time the last of them pass, they will say, there used to be water in the Sea of Galilee. They're on their way to Jerusalem. And our prophet said that they will die in Jerusalem. That's right. At the time when Nabi Isa Islam will return, the last of them would have passed. And they will die. Allah will destroy them in Jerusalem. So the town is Jerusalem. I'm talking to those who think the town is Jerusalem. I am giving this lecture to a people who think and the town is Jerusalem. My teacher 
of blessed memory, Maulana Dr. Muhammad Fadlur Rahman Ansari, came to the same conclusion that the town is Jerusalem. وَحَرَامٌ عَلَى قَرْيَةٍ أَهْلَكْنَاهَا أَنَّهُمْ لَا يَرْجِعُونَ حَتَّى إِذَا فُتِحَتْ يَأْجُوجُ وَمَأْجُوجُ وَهُمْ مِنْ كُلِّ حَدَبٍ يَنْسِلُونَ This is the Arabic for what I've already spoken. Dr. Muhammad Iqbal also came to the same conclusion. خُلْ غَيَيْ يَأْجُوجُ وَمَأْجُوجُ كَلَشْكَرْ تَمَامْ This is Urdu. چَشْمِ مُسْلِمْ لِخْلِ تَفْسِيرْ حَرْفِ يَنْسِلُونَ وَهُمْ مِنْ كُلِّ حَدَبٍ يَنْسِلُونَ حَرْفِ يَنْسِلُونَ He's directing our attention to this passage of the Quran. The town is Jerusalem. So Allah is speaking in the Quran and says, when you see the Jews being brought back to Jerusalem to reclaim it as their own, then those who are bringing them back, those who are bringing the Jews, or those who have brought the Jews back to Jerusalem to reclaim it as their own, they are Gog and Magog. Let me repeat that. The Quran is therefore saying that when you see the Jews being brought back to the Holy Land, to Jerusalem, to reclaim it as their own, the people who were bringing them back, they are Gog and Magog. And so now, Gog and Magog are those who control power in modern Western civilization. And when, when Gog and Magog are released, and they spread out in all directions. Now listen carefully. This will be an event which will occur only once in history. So if it has occurred and you cannot recognize it, you've got to go back to school. <laughs> this will not occur again, only once in history. A people will emerge with indestructible power. No one can stand up to them. Only Allah can destroy them. They will have power that none can resist. They will use that power to oppress. And they will use that power to spread out all over the world and to take control of power in the world. And they will bring the Jews back to the Holy Land. This has already happened. This is the explanation, an Islamic eschatological explanation of modern Western civilization. This, they not only spread out all over the world, they are responsible for facade, that is corruption and that which destroys. There is political facade because of modern Western civilization. Politics today is corrupted. There's economic facade, the economy has been corrupted, and the virus is just putting in the finishing touches. There is monetary facade, but the Dalai Room has no knowledge about that. There's cultural facade, there's educational facade, and there's military facade. This is the explanation of Western imperial wars and Western colonization. The colonized people, we say once more, they were not only colonized, they were not only exploited to deprive them of their wealth, but they were also transformed into carbon copies of the modern West. Modern Western civilization rampaged through the world for 300 years, but some say 309. They did it first with Pax Britannica, and then they did it with Pax Americana. Here is the Islamic eschatological ex uh, explanation of modern Western civilization. And now they are in transition to Pax Judaica. But remember, the Quran has spoken of Karnain, Zul Karnain, meaning that there is a first Karn or a first age and a second Karn or a second age. In the first Karn, they were checked. They were placed behind a barrier. They could do no mischief. 
in the second curtain, the same thing will happen again. How will it unfold? You have to have eyes with which to see. You have to be able to read and penetrate history. Sometimes it's uncomfortable history, like what happened to Russia. Russia was an, a, a feudal state uh, uh, with serfdom. It was an agrarian economy. And, uh, and uh, suddenly, suddenly, mysteriously so, a Bolshevik revolution took place. And then the Soviet Union was established. A virulently atheist state, overtly hostile to Orthodox Christianity. And the rage rampaged on the Orthodox Christians for 70, 60, 70 years. And they threw dust in the eyes of the modern West. <laughs> the modern West was very pleased to see a, a, an atheist state taking control of the Orthodox Christian, a very important part of the Orthodox Christian world, because they hated the Orthodox Christians. They wanted the Orthodox Christians to abandon their faith and become like the West, monkey town. But the Soviet Union threw dust in their eyes. And the Soviet Union rampaged through the Orthodox Christian, destroying the churches and the monasteries, killing the priests and so on, until the West was absolutely convinced. This is a genuine thing. But the Soviet Union also transformed Russia overnight. What they took 300 years to do, the Soviet Union did it in 50, 60 years. Transformed Russia into a modern industrial state with a foundation of science and technology second to none. And it was the Soviet Union that sent Sputnik into the sky to initiate the space age. The United States came after. Hmm? And after the Soviet Union had built Russia into a powerful, powerful state, a modern industrial state, and with a military power that could emerge more powerful than the United States, then the Soviet Union folded its tent and walked away. This is the positive role of the Soviet Union in deceiving the West. They helped the Soviet Union. They had on the hand, greeting relations with the Soviet Union, and they felt that with the Soviet Union, even though externally they were enemies, internally they were working together to be able to crush the Christian, Orthodox Christian world. And this, therefore, was the role of the Soviet Union in transforming Russia. Sometimes Allah uses a wicked man to fulfill his purposes. And as soon as the Soviet Union folded and walked away, overnight, Russia was able to advance rapidly to become the most powerful military force in the world today. Yes, if you, if you can't recognize that, perhaps you should ask yourself, why is it that the United States of America, which has intervened helter-skelter for 200 years in every single part of South America and Central America, overthrowing governments helter-skelter, but cannot intervene militarily in Venezuela, cannot. Why? Because of Russia. And now we see that Russia now has a missile technology that I have explained in my last lecture that could only come from Surah Al-Namal of the Quran, the book of aerodynamics. If you differ with me, fine. This is my view. Wait until the Great War comes and you'll see that power at work. Yes. I am using the Quran to explain geopolitics in Akhir Zaman. What are they doing? But now then, something else has happened. 
that not only has Russia emerged as a powerful military state, but China, communist China, atheist China, has emerged as a powerful economic state, power, economic power, and a monetary power that is challenging the mountain of gold. You know, the Prophet Sam prophesied that the river Euphrates will uncover a mountain of gold, the mountain of gold, the river Euphrates, not the Black Sea. And people will fight for that gold, and 99 out of every 100 will be killed. Mm. And each will say, I am the one who will survive. But the believers must not touch that gold. And we have said that that is not literal. It's not a mountain of the metal which has come out from underneath the river. Rather, it's an ocean of oil which will one day function as a mountain of gold. And that's the petrodollar monetary system. And uh, Russia, on the one hand, the military power, and China, on the one hand, challenging the mountain of gold today. The US dollar is living on borrowed time today. The monetary system is collapsing because of China. And when these two powers form an alliance, and that alliance comes into being to build a force that now can successfully resist modern Western civilization, which has been rampaging through the world for 300 years, we know that the second curtain is now at hand. This is my Islamic eschatological explanation of geopolitics in the end time. That the alliance of modern Orthodox Christian Russia, post-Soviet Russia, and the China which has become an economic powerhouse, that this alliance is the most important geopolitical event which has occurred in history since the birth of modern Western civilization. I don't know how many will agree with me, but this is my view. But there is a second alliance coming in Akhiro Zaman, or the end time, and that is the alliance between those who follow Jesus. Allah's blessings be upon him. And those who follow Muhammad, Allah's blessings be upon him. Our Prophet, Allah's blessings be upon him, has spoken about an alliance that will take place in the end times with Rome. Rome, of course, is Christian. Rome is not Hindu, and Rome is not Buddhist, and Rome is not uh, Jewish. <laughs> Rome is Christian. Uh, but the Hadith has one part of it which is in harmony with the Quran, and another part which is in conflict with the Quran. And I have warned consistently that proper methodology is that the Quran must be recognized as supreme, as absolute truth. And even if a part of a hadith is in conflict with the Quran, it must be rejected. And so uh, they don't understand these things, but I am explaining it to you. It's not just that the prophet has said so, that you'll make an alliance with Rome. And this is the second alliance of the end time. The first is the alliance of Russia with China. And the second is the alliance with Rome and the world of Islam, or the world which follows Muhammad to Islam. The Quran itself, is it in Surah Al-Anfal? The Quran says, Al-Kafiruna ba'duhum awliya'ubad. That those who reject faith, they are allies of each other. If you do not do the same, if you do not form alliances, there will be fitna, turmoil, and facade, great corruption on earth. This is the Quran. So if we are to make alliances, those who have faith, faith, in the one God, with whom should we make an alliance? If 
we are to be faithful to the Quran. And if we are to make alliances, those who have faith in the one God, those who recognize Jesus as the Messiah, those who believe that Jesus will return, who should we make alliances with in the end time? The answer, we must ally ourselves with those who are closest to us in love and affection. It is the Quran, I have to repeat it one more time. It is the Quran which says in Surah Al-Anfal that those who disbelieve, they are people who have alliances with each other. And if you who have faith in the one God, if you do not do the same and form alliances, there will be turmoil, fitna on earth and great, great facade corruption and destruction on earth, so we must form alliances. We who have faith in the one God, who should we form alliances with? We who follow Muhammad, we say we have to form alliances with those who follow Jesus because between them and us there's this one significant bond that we both believe that Jesus will return. So who are those Christians with whom we should form alliance? This is a subject we'll have to take up uh, next week, inshallah, because my time is ending now. But before I end, who are the Christians who are our allies at the time when the Prophet was alive? Did you hear that question? Who are the Christians who were our allies at the time when the prophet was alive? There were those of us who were being persecuted in Mecca. And the prophet said, Allah's blessings be upon him. He said, leave and go to Abyssinia. There is a Christian king in Abyssinia. And Allah will put it in his heart to protect you. And that's what he did. That's what he did. And when that Christian king died, the Negus, a man who believed in the Trinity, a man who worshipped Jesus as the Son of God and the third person in the Trinity, when that Christian king died, and the Prophet Muhammad heard the news of it, in Yatrib, now known as Medina, he performed the funeral prayer in absentia for the Negus. And so clearly, it is those Christians who helped us, who protected us at that time, and who, when the king died, our prophet prayed for him, even though he believed in the Trinity. Even though he worshipped Jesus as the Son of God and Allah condemns that in the Quran, yet he prayed for that man. He performed what is known as the Salatul Janaza. I give this to you to whet your appetite for the next session. Who are those Christians with whom we must form an alliance in Akhir Zaman? Thank you. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.